Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to our video in the series of Employment Income Taxation. Today we look at personal reliefs, a very crucial part of Employment Income Taxation and I'll tell you why. Personal reliefs are provided in the law to reduce a person's tax burden technically. So before we get to your chargeable income and we apply the tax rate, we grant you personal reliefs that you may be entitled to. We are saying over here that in arriving at a chargeable income of a resident individual, take note, as we emphasize um, in the same video, a non-resident individual is not entitled to personal reliefs. And if you've not watched our first video series on the basic principles of income taxation, where we discussed the concept of residents, individual and resident or non-resident individuals and resident individuals please do well to watch that as like i said do well to watch the videos in the order in which they are presented because that is meant to build your understanding of the concept so we are saying here that non-resident individuals cannot enjoy these personal reliefs that resident individuals enjoy so here we are saying that in arriving at a chargeable income of a resident individual for a year you are allowed to deduct the personal release specified in the fifth shadow of the act. So there are a number of reliefs. The first is the marriage or responsibility relief. This is for anyone who has a dependent spouse or at least two dependent children. Take note. And the word dependent, I'll define it. The law defines dependent basically to be anyone to whom you provide the necessities of life. The law does not define necessities of life, but we can take that um, to mean things like providing food, providing shelter, um, providing clothing, and providing certain basic essentials of life. Anyone you provide that for can be said to be your dependent. So I say here that if you are an, you are an individual, you have a dependent spouse or at least two dependent children, you are entitled to a personal relief of 1,200 Ghana cities per month. Take note, reliefs are not cash payments. There are people who say, oh, the GRA owes me 1,200 cities because of the fact that I have a dependent spouse. No. This relief is only available to reduce any chargeable income you may have for the year. Take note, it is not money you can walk to GRA and say, I want my 1,200, I have a dependent spouse and two dependent children. No. What it's saying really is, it is for those who actually have taken the step to have chargeable income. We reduce the chargeable income for the year before we apply the tax rate for them to pay their tax. So if you are in the informal sector, if you run your own small business on the side, you don't file returns with the GRE. They don't know about your business and your income. Forget it. You can't get this relief unless you file your returns, disclose your income, disclose your chargeable income, and then you can enjoy the relief. So take note, the GRE doesn't owe you money. This is a relief that is given to you to reduce your tax burden. Also, there's a common question that says, what if my tax liability is not up to my relief? Do I get a, 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 re, a, a refund of the excess? No. And like I said, it's not money you are owed. So let's say your tax liability for the whole month is 1,000 cities. So someone will say, well, I'm married with um, two dependent children. So GRI should net off their 1,002 and pay me my 200. No. Take note that it is a relief. It is not a refund. It's a relief. We are trying to relieve you where you have tax to pay. Where there's no tax payable, too bad. So it's for those who have tax to pay. We are trying to reduce your, your burden because you have someone you are taking care of. Take note of that. So where you have a dependent spouse or at least two dependent children, your relief is 1,200 Ghana cities. Take note, it is for the whole year. It is not for your month. Okay, the next is a disability relief. This is where you, the individual, are making the claim for the relief. You have a disability. Here, you are entitled to a relief of 25% of your assessable income from either a business or an employment. Take note, it doesn't cover investments. So if you watched our first um, videos on the principles of income tax, 
we established that there are three main income streams for the purposes of income taxation. We have income from employment, which we are looking at now. We have income from business, which we we'll look at in our subsequent sessions. And we have income from investment, which also come in the subsequent sessions. So here, they are saying that the disability relief of 25% of the accessible income only applies to business and employment. And those who have watched our first series on the basic principles we define accessible income there perfectly. So take note here too, um, what you need to do is there needs to be proof that you're actually disabled. So obviously there are clear signs if you've lost a limb or two, it's obvious, but you need a certification from an approved, um, um, anything that can prove that you are actually disabled will be enough proof to give you this relief. The next is old age relief. This is where you yourself, you are 60 years of age and above. In that case, we give you a relief of 1,500 Ghana cities for the year. So if you are 60 years of age and above watching this, um, I applaud your efforts to learn tax. If you know someone who is 60 years of age and above, you can inform them that, oh, if they are still paying taxes anyways, um, and they are working, let them know that they have a relief of 1,500 Ghana CDs for the whole year. The next is child education relief. This is where, or it's for anyone who is sponsoring the education of a child or a ward. So it must not necessarily be your biological child. The law never said it must be your own biological child. No, either a child or a ward, anyone you are taking care of for school. And that person must be in a recognized, registered educational institution in the country. The school must be in Ghana. Then you are entitled to a personal relief of 600 Ghana CDs per child for the year, up to a maximum of three children or wards. So what it means is you have up to 1,800 Ghana CDs as personal reliefs for if you have three children. Take note, they must be in recognized registered schools in Ghana. So I expect this to mean Ghana Education Service recognized or GES certified schools. We don't want any strange schools that GES has in know of. And we, the, the, the schools must be in Ghana for it to count. In that case, you have a relief of 600 CDs per child up to a maximum of three children. So if you have five children too bad, um, you can only claim for three of those five. The next relief is aged dependent relief. This is where you as a person has a dependent you are taking care of who is older than 60 years of age. So we are seeing here, in the case of an individual who has a dependent relative other than a child or spouse. Don't forget that the first relief, which we called here, the marriage and responsibility relief covered who? A dependent spouse or child. So that is aside. If you have any other dependent relative who is 60 years of age and above, then you're entitled to a relief of 1,000 CDs per dependent. But you can only claim for a maximum of two dependent relatives. So maybe your mom and dad who are above um, 60, if you're taking care of them, you can claim 1,000 CDs for each. That will give you 2,000 CDs for a year. That's an example. The next is training relief. This is where you've undergone training to update your professional, technical, occupational skills or knowledge during the year. The law is trying to find a way to make sure you develop your skills and your abilities and your expertise. So we give you back a relief of 2,000 cities. Um, it's, people say it's not too high, but if you knew what it was in the past, you would appreciate this, right? So um, 2,000 cities for the whole year as cost of training. There is clarity provided here um, to mean that the, this does not cover academic programs. So if you go to do a master's program, you're going to do a BSc in admin, you're going to do a BCom, you're going to do a PhD in tax law, whatever. This training relief does not cover. It covers professional, technical, vocational skills, right? So it doesn't cover academic programs. Take note of this. It's training to improve your skills, not to give you a new certificate or a new degree. Okay, take note of that, a new diploma. The next is very important. Where two or more persons qualify in respect of the same child or ward or relative, the Commissioner General will give you only one relief. So the example here is if you and your wife, 
you have a child. In fact, you and your wife have you have um, three children, and it's not possible for you and your wife to claim for all three children. So let's say you, the man, you claim for all three children. Then your wife also claims for all three children. It's like you are claiming for six people. What the law says is you can claim for one. only one person can claim for one. So it's like um, one parent, one child, one mother, one father. Um, in that in that order, right? So we are saying here that you can decide to split it. So maybe the mother will claim for the first child, then the father claims for second and third child, or the mother claims for first and third, and the father claims for second. Whichever way you guys want to split it, you can't all claim for the same child. It's not possible, right? How does the law define dependent? I think I've mentioned this already. It's any individual um, or any child, spouse, or relative for whom you provide the necessities of life. I've explained what this means. Now, we've spoken about personal reliefs. It is possible for there to be a way to operationalize these reliefs. What do I mean? We are saying that the Commissioner General may where an employee applies to the Commissioner General in the prescribed form, right, issue you something called a tax relief card. This will certify the relief to which you are entitled to under the law. What it means is write to the Commissioner General and say, Dear Commissioner General, I am a man of X age. I have a wife of X age. My mother and father are both alive. They are both X age. Um, I take care of three children who attend ABC school. Let him know your circumstance and he'll issue you a, with a tax relief card that certifies the reliefs you are, um, you are entitled to. There's a form on the GRI website. If you watch our video um, on personal release, I think check the section on incentives, tax concessions. You find something there on personal reliefs. Um, we explain how to get these reliefs in practice, right? So here, Commissioner General will give you a tax relief card that will indicate the reliefs you are entitled to. We are saying that the tax reliefs of an employee for a year of assessment is equal to the amount certified on the tax relief card issued to you by the Commissioner General. So what you are entitled to is what the Commissioner General gives you, but there's a condition. Only where the employee has provided the card to his employer. So when you get the card from the Commissioner General, don't keep it in your house. Don't put it under your pillow. Give it, hand it over to your employer so that they are aware that these are the reliefs you are entitled to and these are the reliefs you have to deduct on a monthly basis. I'm saying also that where your circumstances regarding the information provided to the Commissioner General changes, you should notify the Commissioner General so that he updates your information. So let's say you had one child and you were entitled to just one relief and um, by some grace your wife gets pregnant and gives birth to twins so now instead of one child you have three children so you want to claim the maximum benefit for the child education relief of 600 Ghana CDs per month no per year or per child i mean so what we mean here is you write a commercial and say i had one child now i have three i have two extra ones so i have three in total he will update your records and issue with your new tax relief card that will certify the new reliefs you're entitled to. Now, so the Commissioner General will issue you with a new reliefs card where your information has been updated. This is um, crucial. Now, there are some reliefs that can be granted upfront. What does, what does this mean? Upfront means that you are entitled to deduct these reliefs on a monthly basis. You don't need to wait for the whole year to get um, the relief. So don't forget that in as much as the reliefs are stated on an annualized basis, you are still entitled to get some of these reliefs up front. So it means we'll spread them over the 12 month period and deduct them from your pay, your chargeable income before your employer pays you um, your salary. So you, you get a re reduction on a monthly basis, not too significant, but at least it's a way to reduce the tax you are paying on your employment income. So for you to remember this, if you were counting, I think you would check we had six reliefs. So all the reliefs are upfront except training relief, if that will help you remember. So marriage responsibility is upfront, child education is upfront, 
old age is upfront, age dependent is upfront, really, and disability is also what upfront. So apart from training relief, all the other reliefs can be granted on an upfront or monthly basis. This is a common question examiners love to ask. Um, state the reliefs or any of the reliefs that are granted on an upfront basis. Remember that this is a list. It's all the reliefs except your training relief. Another benefit in the law is something called the mortgage interest deduction. Now, this benefit is for those who have mortgages. I'm sure you know what a mortgage is for sure. If you go for a loan and the purpose of the loan is to buy a house or construct your own house, that is basically a mortgage. So there's a mortgage house or a mortgage bank that provides you with this mortgage. So what the law says is you are entitled to deduct mortgage interest in respect of only one residential premises during your entire lifetime. What it means is you must choose and choose carefully. The house you decide to build or the house you decide to buy um, using a mortgage, you need to be careful because once you choose one house, you've exhausted this benefit. So let's say you buy a house at um, Medina because that was what you could afford back then then your circumstances change now you can afford east legon or you can afford airport hills we don't care that you can afford that now you've already exhausted the benefits on your medina um, premises because it's one accommodation or one residential premises during your entire lifetime we don't want people abusing this benefit for business purposes so let's say one person gets their primary um, residential premises utilize the benefit then they buy another house in East Legon, another house in Airport Hill, another house in Cantonment, and they want to utilize this benefit and be renting this or these other houses to people. It doesn't work like that. We want to give the benefit for where you live, your primary um, accommodation, um, primary residential premises. So take note, once you utilize it for one house, that's it, you can change pretty much, right? So here I'm saying that mortgage interest is defined to mean interest incurred by an individual. In respect of borrowing or a loan employed in constructing or acquiring the individual's only place of residence if you have multiple houses too bad for you it is the the first house you claim for that's what you can only claim for now what i'm about to mention is for exceptional students you will most likely not find this in any textbook anywhere i dare you to find it let me know if you found um, this court case in any textbook on the markets, you can type it in the comments um, box below. This is a, a court ruling that was issued at the end of 2019. It became public really um, in January 2020. That provided clarity on the mortgage interest deduction. So when this um, mortgage interest deduction has been in the Income Tax Act since it was passed, um, what the GRA has really interpreted this to mean is they are saying that you know what wait for the end of the year until you can deduct your mortgage interest one taxpayer by the name Kwesi Nanchecho Redu, i think he's a tax consultant himself he took GRA to court and said he is not in agreement with GRA's interpretation he Kwesi Nanchecho argued that what the law said or what the law meant to do was to ensure that people could deduct their mortgage interest up front remember i've defined up front with respect to their personal relief, right? So Kwesi's argument was that the mortgage interest deduction should be given to taxpayers on a monthly basis. GRA was arguing that the mortgage interest should be given at the end of the year when we've determined your tax liability, then we tell you, okay, your mortgage for the year is this. So they fought in court, not fought really, but they argued in court and guess who won? Kwesi Nyantechi won the case and the court ruled in his favor and said that mortgage interest should now be deducted upfront. So this is now the position in practice in the real world. So if you are learning for exam, like I said, this is for exceptional students. If you mentioned an exam, your exam will probably be impressed, I guess. All right. So this is one new um, provision that has introduced some amount of clarity to how mortgage interests are to be treated on a monthly basis. Very important to remember this. Now, like I mentioned earlier, non-resident individuals, generally, 
are not entitled to any personal relief. So I'm saying here again that except where clearly provided for under something called a double taxation agreement, which is an agreement Ghana enters into with other contracting states to do two main things, to either avoid double taxation or prevent fiscal evasion, right? That's at the basic level. Um, so they're saying except where provided for under a double taxation agreement, a non-resident person is not entitled to any of the personal relief that I mentioned. So either marriage, disability, old age, age dependence, child education, uh, what's the last one? Training. Non-residents are not entitled to any of those. Or they are also not entitled to the mortgage interest relief under or what we just spoke about, where you get a deduction on a monthly basis for any loan interest you've incurred to buy your own house or um, build a house and take note it must be you are entitled to just one house for entire lifetime let's look at um, another thing that will probably be of very um, key use to you is where you make contributions and donations to a worthwhile cause so here the law says in section 100 of act 896 that where the income for a year of assessment in respect of a person Remember we said in the basic principles video that a person could mean what? An individual or an entity, right? So I think that in respect of a person who has made a donation or contributed to a worthwhile cause is to be ascertained, the person may claim a deduction that is equal to the contribution and donation made by the person during the year, but it must be to a worthwhile cause. So we are saying that where you are de to determine your income for the year your chargeable income the law allows you to deduct some donations you've made so if you're a very charitable person you like giving to um, the needy and other um, worthwhile courses we need to make sure that we find a way to reward you you can deduct the donations you've made in arriving at your chargeable income for the year but the law defines what the worthwhile causes right you just can't get up and be donating anyhow so the first is a charitable organization which meets the requirements of section 97 over here you find religious organizations to be here including our churches if you are interested in learning more about taxation of churches read our video or watch our video on um, controversial issues where we clarify the issue of taxation of churches right the next thing we need to look at the next thing we need to look at will be where you make a donation to a scheme of scholarship for an academic, technical, professional or other course of study. So if you donate to any um, scholarship fund for the promotion of education, you can deduct that donation in arriving at your chargeable income for the year. Where you also donate to the development of any rural area or urban area, it's also an allowable deduction. It's a worthwhile course where you donate to or you donate towards sports development or sports promotion. It's also an allowable deduction. And the final one is any other worthwhile course approved by the Commissioner General. And a very recent um, example under the last point under the any other worthwhile course approved by the Commissioner General is. When the government set up the COVID-19 trust fund somewhere last year, I think in April or May, yeah, around that time, April, May. Um, so the COVID-19 trust fund act was passed by parliament and established the COVID-19 trust fund and said that anyone who donated to that fund to help Ghana fight the COVID-19 pandemic would be deemed to be a worthwhile cause and they could deduct this um, donation in arriving at their chargeable income for the year. So take note, um, when we do business income, we'll go into a lot more details into donations, where we look at things such as for sports development, you can't donate to um, um, a sport, a, a football club in your area. So let's say you live you live in Ashaiman and you, do, you donate something to the Ashaim, Ashaiman under 14 football club. Um, it won't count because the impact of that football club cannot be felt really. If you donate to the Black Stars or the, are they called Black Queens? Yeah, donate to the Black Stars or Black Queens, 
then we feel that that is something of national concern so you are contributing to support development but not some and that's all one that 14 football club in your area it doesn't really count you can't deduct those ones that's in practice right okay let's look at something related to casual workers there's a special way the law wants us to tax workers who are casual so it's saying that where a person makes payment to a casual worker that payment shall be treated as income earned by that casual worker and the person shall withhold tax from the gross income paid to that casual worker at the rate of 5%. The tax withheld is a final tax. I've explained final tax in our previous sessions. Who is a casual worker? Definition of casual worker can be found in section 78 of the Labor Act 2003, Act 651. It defines a casual worker to mean a worker who is engaged on a work, which is seasonal, or intermittent and not for a continuous period of more than six months and whose remuneration is calculated on a daily basis so where an employer or anyone makes payments to a casual worker who meets this definition they are required to withhold tax at five percent and that is it the casual worker does not owe any other tax with respect to the same amount take note casual workers are, are liable to just a five percent final withholding tax rate the next we need to look at is temporary workers i see now here where you make a payment to a temporary worker still defined under section 78 of the labor act access 51 that payment shall be treated as income earned by that temporary worker and that person shall withhold tax from that income in accordance with the income tax act and official what it means is if you remember the income tax rates i introduced you to the personal income tax rate that is in bands that is in layers ending at 30 percent if you make a payment to a temporary worker you withhold at that rate those set of rates so remember casual workers are liable to a five percent final tax temporary workers are liable to the personal income tax rates Take note, people confuse the two, people confuse casual workers and temporary workers. How does the law define a temporary worker? It says a temporary worker is a worker who is employed for a continuous period of not less than one month and is not a permanent worker or employed for a work that is seasonal in character. So anyone who is employed for a continuous period of not less than one month and it's not a permanent worker or employed for a work that is seasonal in character is a temporary worker for the purpose of this definition now let's look at as we come to the end let's look at things um, these are more areas that examiners want to pick on right we call them other benefits or perks or perquisites right so this is a case where the employer pays your personal liability such as your income tax so in, in some companies the employer actually says, you know what, don't even pay tax, I'll pay your tax for you. So all, your, all you need to think about is you are coming to work and you are paying money. Technically, what the employer is doing is, they are, there's a way to do this in practice. You need to do some grossing up of the amount and all of that to determine the actual um, amount. Because people negotiate their salaries on a net basis. You can tell your employer that, you know what, this job I'm doing for you, I want you to pay me $10,000 net. I don't care what you do, but make sure that what you pay me or what hits my bank account is 10,000. That way, the employer has to work backwards from the gross figure that will give him a net of 10 and pay the tax to GRE. That income tax here is a benefit you are getting. So in as much as the employer is paying tax for you, it is a benefit which you have, you have to pay tax on, right? A long wider discussion. The point here is, some employees decide to pay their employees tax for them. The employer should in bed. They can decide to pay your electricity bill for you. Some pay your water bill for you. Some even pay your children's school fees. Some jobs have really good benefits. We are saying that all of these things constitute income in the employee's hands and must be taxed. Some examples um, examiners love is the use of domestic servants. So we can break domestic servants into two main major groups. The first group 
will constitute people like gardeners, security men, and others who have a duty to keep or protect or watch or maintain the property. That is, such domestic servants work to protect the interests of the employer who provides a property for the use of the employee. So here we have, let's say you live in a company house, company accommodation. Company has provided you a place to live. And when you went to the house, you met a security man there. The security man is there not for you. He's there for the company. He's protecting the company's house. Fine, you live in it. But if you lose your job today and they replace you with another person, that person will go into that house and will meet the same security person there. So the security person is not there for your benefits per se. Same with if there is a gardener or a garden boy, as we call it in Ghana. And this gardener maintains the lawn, the flowers in the house and everything. Whether or not you live in the house, whether or not you work with that employer, that gardener will come every day to water the flowers. So he is not there to service you, he's there to maintain the house. We are saying that when the property is owned by the employee, that is in your own house, and the employer provides the use of these domestic servants, then it's a benefit in kind and we will tax you on this. I think therefore, the total amendment will be added to the employee access to tax. There are two ways to look at this. Let's say you are an employee. Scenario, scenario one is where you actually move into company house. It is not your house. Company gave you a house. When you went, there was a security man and everything. There was a gardener. It is not a benefit. We are not taxing you on it because they are there really to protect the company's property. They are there to maintain the house, to make sure it's neat and everything. So you don't really have any tax liability. If the company pays them directly, then in that case, they are the ones who bear the tax, right? We are saying also that if it is your house, a house you own, and then the company gives you the domestic servants. In that case, they are there to serve you, maintain your house. So it's a benefit you are enjoying. So we must tax you on this benefit. It will be a benefit in kind. Let's look at scenario two. This is where you have people such as stewards, cooks, and the rest who provide personal services. They come and prepare your favorite soup for you. Come and prepare grilled chicken for you. They come and serve you in person. They wash your clothes. In this group of domestic servants, it's the employee who receives the benefits. Therefore, it doesn't matter whether it's the employee's own house or it's accommodation provided by the employer. All of these benefits will be taxed on the employee because they are enjoying. So take note for personalized um, gains such as um, cooks, um, laundry people, people who do your laundry clean, clean your bedroom. All of these people are providing personal services to you. You are the one enjoying. It has something to do with the house or anything so you pay tax on this benefit there are some other things to look at when it comes to this, these benefits where the the employer the domestic servant is paid directly by the employer you really don't have any business sometimes right because if their salary is 500 cities the employer pays them 500 cities. it ends there right but if the employer gives you the money and then you in turn pay them a salary then it is money that is in your hands because we tax you and you can decide whether to pay them the full amount or not so when it comes to um, domestic servants key thing to take away from here is the second group especially where you have people who provide personalized services to the employee whether it is the employer's house or the employee's own house the benefit is taxable in the hands of the employee. The other case is where the domestic servants, such as um, gardeners, security men, and all of those who don't provide as much of a personalized service, if they are there to provide services to an employee who lives in company house, it is deemed that they are protecting company prop and property. They are maintaining company property. In that case, no benefits per se may be taxed in the hands of the employee. If, however, the services of the domestic servants, the gardener, the watchman, the security man, as you call it, 
provide these services to the employee in the employee's personal house, in their own house, then in that case, the benefit is um, assessed on the employee. It's important to remember this. So once again, let's do a quick recap of what the rates look like. These are the rates you'll be using to compute the personal income tax um, for an individual when we begin to do the exam questions on this topic. So just know what it is, know what it looks like. Know that I start from 0% and ends at 30%. Note also that for non-resident individuals, they are taxed at a flat income tax rate of 25%. We've come this far. Let's look at a few concept checkers and then we can call it a day. So question one, required. State the key changes introduced by this court ruling. I really want an examiner to test this uh, case. At least they should be testing current issues, right? So the case of Kwesi Nyante Chiwori Group as Commission General of GRA 2019 introduced significant changes to how mortgage interest amounts are to be utilized by employees in Ghana. Required. States the key changes introduced by this court ruling. So um, you can press pause and try, but summary is that the key changes introduced is the case has introduced the requirement or the need or the ability of employees to take their mortgage interest deductions on a monthly basis as opposed to the GRA's view that their mortgage interest deduction should be done or taken on an annual basis. Next question is um, the Labor Act defines a temporary worker to mean a worker engaged on work which is seasonal or intermittent and not for a continuous period of more than six months and whose remuneration is calculated on a daily basis. True or false? True or false? True or false? The answer is false. This is the definition for a casual worker, not a temporary worker. Take note, it's just a trick question. This to remind you that for tax, Every keyword matters. We need to remember the key terms, the key provisions that will ensure you succeed in your exam. Third question, and I guess it's the final question. Required is um, explain to Anthony the child education release available to him. So Anthony Joshua is a Ghanaian tax resident individual who works as a chartered accountant in his own practice. He has four children who are all enrolled in private schools. Two of the children school at Bronze Bomber International School in Accra, whereas the other two children school at Dominic Brazil International School in New York. Explain to Anthony the child education release available to him. You can hit pause. You should hit pause actually and give this a try. So here, um, the answer really is Anthony has four children. He can only get benefits for three. That's step one. However, he can only get benefits for three if all three are in Ghanaian registered, recognized educational institutions. Out of the four children, he has two who school in Accra. So your answer should be that to the extent that the schools in Accra are registered and recognized by the GES or the relevant um, licenses or certifying bodies, then those two children will enjoy the child education relief of 600 CDs per child. For the two children who school in New York, they are not entitled, or Anthony is not entitled to any benefit on them because the schools are not in Ghana. Now that we've done this, let's summarize um, employment income. Let's bring this whole session to a close. We've said that there are specific amounts to be included and excluded from determining employment income. We've learned a number of these over the course of these videos. Employers are required to withhold tax from the payment of an amount to be included in ascertaining the income of an employee from the employment. There are special rules to be followed in determining the amount of tax due on overtime and bonus payments. We looked at this. Where an employer provides accommodation and motor vehicle benefits, there are fixed amounts to be used to value the amount of the benefits. I hope you remember the table. Where an employer provides loans for an employee, 
there are a number of criteria to be checked in order to ensure or to determine the amount is taxable. The next is resident individuals can take advantage of personal reliefs to reduce their tax liability. So this brings us to the end of our session on employment income. Remember, like I said, we will have a series of videos after we complete the tuition phase where we'll focus solely on exam questions, take um, past papers and solve a number of questions. So make sure you follow this video series and look out for our session where we'll pick typical exam questions and look at the computational as aspects. I'll show you the formats, the template the examiner requires and all of those. So if you love this as usual, please smash the like button and share this video within your network. I'll catch you in the next session. Thank you.